If you're trying to stand out in the financial planning field, the CFP designation might be one of the best options available for you. By the end of this video, you're gonna know exactly what goes into someone getting the CFP designation, and you might even have a little bit more respect for the people you see on LinkedIn with those three letters behind their name. What's up guys, welcome back to the channel, Apple here. Today we're gonna to be talking about the CFP designation, which is something that I'm very, very passionate about myself. I've been studying for this exam for a few months now, and it's been really eye-opening to me just to be able to see all of the things that go into this designation and to learn more about it as I go. I'm definitely gonna be sharing more about it in the coming weeks as I continue to study, prep for this exam, share with you guys some of the things that, that go into it, into, into these study materials here, and just really what the process looks like as a whole for those of you who might be interested in pursuing some kind of professional designation in the personal finance industry. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure you head down below, subscribe to the channel, and uh, stick around for all of those. Now let's dive right on into it. So what is the CFP? Well, it stands for Certified Financial Planner, and it's really the premier designation for anyone in the financial planning industry. It covers a lot of things from investments to insurance, to estate planning, to a whole host of things that a financial planner really needs to know about in order to provide someone with a full picture of their financial situation. Because if you work with someone who is going to basically coach you and, and provide you with advice and guidance on how to structure your entire financial life, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that they know what they're talking about on all fronts. And so the CFP really is an all-inclusive way to make sure of that. Now, I'm not gonna to dive too deep into this video and in, into like all the different things that it covers. That'll be a future video for sure. But uh, that is, in a nutshell, basically, it's a designation that shows that, that a person that you're working with is competent, they are held to a high standard, and they're legally bound to act in your best interest, which is pretty important for someone who's going to be uh, taking control of potentially a lot of your financial life and helping you make those good decisions. All right, so now how do you become a CFP, okay? There are four requirements that you need to fulfill on before you can achieve this designation. The first of which is the education requirement, okay? So there's a couple different aspects of the education requirement. They all start with E, actually. We'll just go through all of them quick, real quick, just so you know. So there's the education requirement, there's the experience requirement, there's the exam requirement, and there's the ethics requirement, okay? So they call them the four E's. It's pretty easy to remember that way, but there's two main aspects to the education requirement. The first of which is you need a bachelor's degree, okay? So there are no CFPs out there that do not have at least a bachelor's degree. You need to get yourself one of these guys right here uh, before you can actually become a certified financial planner. Now, it's a bit controversial. Uh, some people would argue that you don't need to have a bachelor's degree to be a well-adept financial planner. That's neither here nor there, but um, that is going to be one of the requirements to get this certification. Now, during that, you're going to also need to go through the CFP curriculum. So that's going to teach you the things that I was mentioning earlier uh, about insurance, investments, estate planning, retirement plans, all of that good stuff. That is all in a CFP curriculum, okay? And some colleges, actually, the college that I went to, the University of Wisconsin, they have a degree plan, a personal finance degree that is integrated with the CFP curriculum. So I was able to get my uh, bachelor's degree while I fulfilled on the CFP education requirement at the same time, kind of get two birds with one stone there, because if you got to go through all these four years of school and then you have to do the CFP curriculum, that's a lot of, a lot of education. So if you can kind of wrap those two things together and a lot more colleges are doing that these days, it's going to be very advantageous for for you uh, in getting this decree. Now, also included in the CFP curriculum is a capstone project. So this is basically at the end, you make a huge financial plan for some hypothetical clients. Mine turned out to be around 100 pages long. So uh, they get pretty intense and uh, they're, they're definitely a huge, huge commitment that you have to um, really, really be working on for, for a significant amount of time. But that is kind of the experience requirement. In a nutshell, you've got the bachelor's degree, you've got the CFP curriculum, and then you've got the capstone project there. Next, let's move on to the exam requirement. So this is what I'm studying for right now. That's what uh, this big stack of books over here is all about. These are some of my study materials for this exam. It's quite an exam, guys. It's six hours long, so they give you a three hour period. You get a little break for lunch and then you get another three hour period, so it's all in one day. So with this exam, you've got 170 multiple choice questions that you've got to go through. And now that might not seem like a whole lot. I mean, some of them can be pretty, pretty intense. So you'll have things like just straight multiple choice questions. You'll have a couple cases 
in your exam where, you're, where you'll have a ton of, of client information basically, and then you've got maybe 10 to 15 questions about that huge batch of client information. And so there's a lot that goes into this, okay? It's, it's not a very numbers heavy exam though. A lot of people think that it's gonna be all, all number crunching and calculator based, but uh, the exam, uh, at least to my understanding, what I've learned about it so far, uh, is that it's not very numbers intensive. Of those 170 questions, maybe only 10 of them are, are real deep into the calculator questions. Most of them are, what should the planner do in this situation? Okay, so if this client comes in, here's what their situation is, what should the planner do to help them or to help them move along in their financial journey? Okay, so it's very, very much, you have to be able to think in the shoes of a planner. That is kind of what the exam is based on. And it covers those exact same categories that I mentioned earlier. So you've got your, your fundamentals, you've got your insurance, your estate, all of that stuff is, is wrapped into the exam. All right, so to dive into this just a little bit more granularly, we're now on the CFP board's website. So you can see the different categories that this exam is made up of. So first you've got your professional conduct and regulation, you've got your general principles, your education planning. So if you wanna send a kid to college, what's that gonna cost? How do you plan for that? Risk management and insurance. This is a pretty big category. It's pretty important. You gotta know about things like life insurance, property, auto, uh, liability, all these different kinds of insurance. You gotta be very well-versed in that. Investment planning, again, one of the larger categories here is how do you help an individual invest for retirement? How do you help them invest to reach their goals? Very, very important thing that financial planners need to be aware of. Next, tax planning. So this is one of the ones that's crushing me right now in my studying. There's so much that goes into income tax, property tax, all the different kinds of taxes that are out there. So um, this one is crushing me for sure. And it's very intertwined with a lot of the other categories. We got your retirement savings and income planning. You've got your estate planning. So that's what happens when you die. How do you plan for that? So as you can see, there's a ton of different things that go into this exam. And uh, you really do have to know your stuff in order to be well prepared to sit for this thing. All right, so that brings us to experience, okay? So once you've got the education done, once you've got the exam passed, then you actually need to get experience in the field before you can call yourself a certified financial planner. So this is one of the biggest hurdles or will be the biggest hurdle for me. After I pass this exam, then I've got to go out there and get potentially up to three years of full-time experience in a financial planning role before I can call myself a certified financial planner. Okay, so we're going to dive back into the CFP board's website to dive into this requirement. There are a little bit of nuances here, but uh, this one is quite sizable for sure. All right, folks, so here we've got this handy infographic that's gonna show us how to fulfill on this experience or requirement. So you've either got the 6,000 hour standard pathway or the 4,000 hour apprenticeship pathway. So based on a 40 hour work week, assuming 50 weeks of work per year, that's gonna be 2,000 hours. So this 6,000 hour pathway, that's three years of full-time working somewhere. Uh, the 4,000 is gonna be two years full-time working somewhere. So. Basically, what you need to be doing here is you need to be doing one or more of the basic tasks of a financial planner as defined by the CFP board. So interacting with clients, supervising um, the delivery of a financial plan, supporting individual clients, internships or residency, and teaching. So you have to be doing one of those while also doing one of these. So these are the seven steps of the financial planning process. Anyone studying for this exam will need to know these very well, inside and out, upside and down. So you have to be doing at least one of these steps of the financial planning process while also um, being in one of these settings, okay? There's a little bit of leeway there, okay? You only have to be doing one of the seven things. You only have to be doing one of these areas. But with the apprenticeship pathway, again, because it's a whole, you cut a whole year off your timeline, it, it's a lot more specific, a lot more rigorous. So you have to be personally delivering financial advice and, and financial planning to an individual client, okay? So actually working in that client-facing role while being supervised by a CFP, okay? So you need to have a CFP supervising you in this role while doing all seven steps of the financial planning process, okay? So as you can see, it's a lot more rigorous to go this way and you really have to be doing a role that is very applicable to, to being a certified financial planner as opposed to the standard pathway where there's a lot more leeway on what you can actually get to count for experience, which it's good to have the standard pathway for people who have already been working in the industry for a while, because if you've been working in the industry for a while, decide you wanna get your CFP, then you, you sit for the exam and potentially you already have all of the 
experience requirement done based on your past role. But if you're just coming in from scratch, that's where you're going to have to really consider, okay, does it make more sense for me to find a place where I can do one of these and take three years? Or is it worth the while to, to really find a place where I can do all of them at once under a CFP straight to a client and, uh, and knock it out in two years? So that's the education uh, requirement in a nutshell. All right, so last one, okay, we're not even there yet. You go through all of those things and you still can't call yourself a CFP until you fulfill on the ethics requirement. So the ethics requirement is basically committing yourself to a strict standard that's gonna ensure that you act in the best interest of your clients and really uphold the respect and the credibility that the CFP marks really have. I mean, if you have a bunch of CFPs running around doing this and that, it's, it's really gonna degrade on the mark. So you have to commit to this high level of ethics than a standard financial planner, a standard individual in the personal finance industry needs to commit to, to, to really hold the prestige of these marks. So what does that entail? Well, first is the fiduciary standard. Okay. So with the fiduciary standard, you're bound to act in the best interest of your client. Okay. You have to put your client's interests ahead of your own, and you have to clearly disclose any potential conflicts of interest, okay? This is something that is so, so important if you're working with anyone in the financial industry, anyone in any industry, honestly. The fiduciary standard is a must because if someone is acting under the fiduciary standard, you know that your interests are coming above theirs and that is very, very important, especially in the financial industry. Next, there are three kind of documents that you have to agree to follow. That's the code of ethics, the practice standards, and the rules of conduct, okay? So you commit to following those three things acting under the fiduciary standard. Um, and then along with the first three requirements as well, then you can potentially qualify to be a certified financial planner. So then what comes next? I mean, at that point, you're able to um, set yourself apart from, again, like pretty much everybody else in the financial planning industry by having these letters behind your name. People know that, okay, this person put in the work, they put in the years to get this designation and they really do know their stuff. It lets you set yourself apart from the side of the, the, the financial planning industry that you, you might really not want to be associated with. I mean, there are bad actors in, in every industry, but uh, the financial planning industry can tend to get a bad rap for, for some of the stuff that's gone on there in the past. So uh, being able to get this designation, put that behind your name, can really set yourself apart from, from everybody else out there. So if this was helpful for you, please do consider subscribing to the channel, clicking that bell icon to be notified anytime I put out more personal finance related content. If you want to learn more about the CFP exam as well, please do drop that in the comments below. Be happy to answer any questions that I can and plan to make more content around my studies, around the exam, around just the whole, the whole process. This is my life right now. So I want to share that with, with you guys as well. So if that's something you're interested in, again, let me know in the comments, click subscribe, all that jazz, but that's about it for this video. So uh, don't forget to smash the like button and I will see you in the next one.